All right, so um, I have this uh, lifelong dream of writing a book about building great products. And um, I've, I've had, through my career, a lot of different roles. I've been, been a designer, I've worked as a developer, a user researcher, a business developer. I was one scrum master. I was a product owner, product manager, then I managed a division. I've been an agile coach. I've been a board member. I've, I've seen it from all the angles. So I actually believe that uh, some way far down, I have something to teach, or I, at least I have a story to tell. Uh, and that's why I wanted to write a book. Um, now, I've had my share of failures uh, along the way, but I can see that the way we're approaching things now is so much more efficient than when we first started out. So I actually, I actually believe that I have something to tell. So why don't I just write this book? Um, well, the problem is that I want it to be a success as well. I want to be confident that what I have to teach is, is relevant and that I'm teaching it in a way that people understand. I don't want, want to waste my time on, on writing a book if it's not going to be a success. So, there's so, much, so many unknowns in making this big blockbuster. There's, uh, there's the topic, there's the content, there's the case studies I put in there, there's the narrative, there's the tone of voice, that's how I should market it. There's, uh, there's the, uh, who's my target audience. Um, there's a whole lot of unknowns that, that I need to do research on to even figure out if, if this is even remotely relevant. So first, there's a topic. Um, is what I have to tell even interesting? So what I'm doing right now is actually an experiment. That's right, you're part of an experiment. And thank you. Um, one way to find out if people are actually interested in what you have to tell uh, is putting on an event. See if, if people will show up see uh, if they respond well to what you have to tell. And yesterday I had a workshop, and fortunately it was, it was sold out, so at least that was some proof that uh, the topic was interesting. And putting on the workshop, I can even play around with the outline of the book uh, to see uh, if it would match, if people would respond. I had a live audience for that. So, this is actually not the first time I'm conducting this experiment. So this experiment uh, is a bit more refined than, than first. So at first, I, uh, the first time I tested this, this uh, did this experiment in, in an event form was actually in December 2017. And I've continued to, to refine it and make it better and better and better. So in that way, I, I see both what people respond to uh, but also uh, if it actually makes sense, if I'm promising too much. Now, I like that approach, and I, I believe that approach to finding out how to make something successful, how to build a successful product is good. But I come from another place. I come from a place that I see way too often for, in so many companies, in so many startups, startups and corporate uh, life. And that is this thinking of, well, we have an idea. What does it take to make that happen? Let's design it. Okay, you can see it. We got sketches. Okay, let's build it, and then we ship it. And once you ship it, it's too late. You find out that it wasn't a success. It wasn't a good idea. Or at least that version of it wasn't a good idea. So I come from this development background first. And uh, I told myself that agile development was going to rescue us all. Okay, because we could change after a sprint, we just change directions. But when it comes to show, we don't. We just continue sprint after sprint after sprint doing the same thing. And even though we have the chance to stop and see, should we go another direction, there is no ceremony in Scrum or Agile uh, that tells us uh, that you should actually look if, if what you're actually doing is that the right thing or not. Are you going in the right direction? Are you on, on the right path? So, agile development is actually, let's see here, 
Agile development is good at focusing teams on executing, on executing incremental change, and that's good. But we tend only to take in the changes that uh, keep us from actually making the solution we first intended. So when we first start, start out the product, uh, we make the backlog, and it's so nice to get that big overview of everything we have to do, because now the path is clear, we know what to do, and we divide that up in, into sprints. And the problem with that is that we tend to focus on what to build and when to build it and forget why. So we are stuck in with a tunnel vision, okay? We, we, get, we don't get our head out of the water. So what I'm saying is that there is significant work to be done before you start executing. There's a thing called figuring out what to do. Do customers want this? Is this problem even worth solving? Can we build it? Can we make money on it? So the problem is that there's a search phase before you go to the execution phase, but people tend to start at the top and say, how, how hard can it be? Let's just build this. And what they do is that they assemble their whole team let's say eight, nine people, and they go, they build it, and they get stuck. Now, that's an expensive way to find out that your idea is not good, or at least that version you're working on right now of the idea is not good. So instead, I suggest that we start at the foot of the hill, and then you can be more methodically uh, doing it, and when you get stuck, uh, it's okay, because that was kind of the purpose and you're not a whole team gathered around this, you just want two people maybe, okay? So it's a much better way to get stuck in the search phase because the intention is not to implement the plan, it is to search. So what I'm preaching today is, is, is going up the hill through experiments and making constantly more and more sophisticated and refined experiments so at, at one point of time you can say, I am certain that my idea, the version I have of it now, the how I'm going to execute it, is going to be a success. So back to the book. I want to put, I put on this event, or Christian and the other guys put it on. Well, instead of writing a book, I could also do something else. I could make this single feature product a skimmed down version of it. So I did. I created this card deck which is 60 experiments explained in kind of the, how I wanted to do it in the book. It was just an easy way to get that out. And to test if that experiment would work, I did another experiment. So I just had 10 experiments collected and described. Uh, so I put that online on a landing page saying, I have uh, this deck coming out. You can pre-order it. And, and it went for about six months. And Fortunately, people actually pre-ordered. If they hadn't, I would have paid back the money. Okay? So what I had there is I put, I had people actually put skin in the game, put money out of their wallet, and pay for it. Okay? So this showed intent. So I was confident that I was onto something here and that it was valuable, or at least a promise of it was valuable uh, to our target audience. So this is how the pre-order looked. Uh, and you can see the design of the cards is, is pretty much different. Uh, and this is how it looked when we launched. So I established this landing page with pre-orders, and that was a bridge to conduct more exper uh, experiments to learn even more. So suddenly, I would start running test ads, figuring out uh, what kind of message that pe would people respond to uh, more or, or less. And I could offer samples to get more feedback and more qualitative feedback. And I could do a bunch of stuff. Okay? So one experiment leads to the other and will take you up that hill. All right. So here's a fact. 72% of all product innovation flops. So let's do this experiment. I want you to take out your uh, goodie bag uh, push notebook. Can you do that for me? And what I want you to do is take a blank page, and I want you to write or sketch just in a few words 
the idea that you're working on right now. You've got 20 seconds for that. Just sketch it, just so you have it down. It can be in your own words, just so you remember what it is. OK? Sketch down your idea. All right, you got it? About done? Just make it quick. It's OK. I'm not going to test you. I'm not going to go through them all. OK? So what I want you to do now is take that page, tear it out of the book. Do that, please. Tear it out. OK, that sounds good. Perfect. All right, so what I want you to do now is hold that idea up here with one hand. Hold it up. Come on. I want to see more. Perfect. Now take the other hand up to it and tear it apart. Thank you so much, because chances are that the idea or the version of the idea that you'll succeed with is different than the one you have right now. Okay? You gotta acknowledge that. And that is the first lesson, acknowledging that what you're working on right now will probably not gonna is not probably not gonna happen. So however our good our ideas are, we have to admit that there is no proof that it's going to work. And that's the hard part. That is truly the hard part. If you don't admit that uncertainty is at its maximum when you're just starting out with an idea, then you're going to go implement something that nobody wants. OK? So it's about admitting Acknowledging that the path from idea to successful product is not straight. You've all seen this before, I know. It's about acknowledging that there's important work to be done before you start executing your plan. It's about searching for the right way to implement through uh, experimentation. And the problem is, if you don't do this, that if you think that you got all of that stuff right, that you know it all, then you start off the, on, on, the, on the wrong side of this, and you assume that you have a success, successful product already. And you say, how hard can it be? And you get stuck because you didn't do your homework. OK? And this is happening all over so, so many companies. You get stuck. OK? So, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, that's two completely different mindsets. One is about innovation, coming from idea to making something happen to be successful. The other one is about improving something existing. Okay? So one is efficiency, optimization, where the other one is growth. When you talk about visions in, in the innovation space, you talk about that failure is, 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 should be embraced. And of course, because that's the whole setup, we are experimenting. I believe failure is probably the wrong word because it's just your hypothesis that's proven wrong. And on the left-hand side, your main job is experimentation. On the right-hand side, you make a business plan and you execute it. So the expectation is to implement it. And that's the problem. We're stuck in this design build ship. When we make our business plan, we put all the numbers in there. We assume so much stuff that we don't test. Okay? And then the problem with business plans is that the expectation is to implement it. So we just carry on as if we knew everything about how to manage our problem that we didn't even make, as if it was already successful. Now, the problem with having a business plan is that it maximizes the risk of failure if you're just starting out. When you're just starting out, business plans are a waste of time. Scott Cook uh, of Intuit, who's really in, uh, a, 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 into uh, the Lean Startup process, said that for every failure, any in one of the failures that had spreadsheets that, that looks awesome. And that's a problem. You can make everything look so awesome in spreadsheets. The problem is it's fantasy, OK? So in order to do any innovation work at all, 
you need to embrace the left-hand side. And for that to happen, you need to go around this build mesh you learn loop. And your goal there is to go as around it as fast as, uh, as possible, because you want to do innovation as, as fast as possible. So when you're stuck in this design, build, ship kind of uh, mindset, you're actually just stuck in step one of the build, measure, loon loop. Okay? And then the next problem is the way we interpret this loop is that we build something, we code something up, and we let it loose, and real people come in. So we measure it, and we learn new ideas, and, and we, can, we, can, we can build more stuff on it. But in reality, it's just wrong. So when we're building, and building is, is the wrong word, because we're actually just doing experiments. We're doing experiments to get a baseline, to get basic knowledge about how the future would look like. How would our click-through rate be? What kind of money would people uh, pay for it? Do people even have the problem we're trying to solve? Okay. And the problem is that this phase, about the building phase, gets bloated. That is not experiments, that you build actual stuff. And then you don't have a baseline, or at least the baseline comes late. So how would an experiment look like? This is a screenshot from uh, uh, Buffer when they just uh, uh, got the idea of building a product. They didn't have a real product, they just made a landing page. And this was all they had. So as you can see, there's a uh, button. Uh, and when you click the plan some pricing button, you're taken to a new page where it says, oops, sorry, you caught us, we're not ready. OK? So why do this? So what happened is that they could measure intent, how many people of all the visitors would actually click that button, and they can figure out if people were actually interested in buying it. So in one way, they actually validated that there was enough interest. So their next experiment was, uh, uh, was uh, putting in this landed, this pricing page, to test different pricing points. Okay. So they simulated uh, with another, another experiment called Dry Wallet, where you simulate a pay now experience to see how much money people would buy. So there was no payment gateway. There was no product. It was just a landing page. But after this, they had significant and important information and learning uh, that uh, made it possible for them to uh, go out and execute fast and with great success. So building landing pages is a great way to do this. But unfortunately, uh, the common approach, the approach that you see too often is that uh, you have a great idea, you say, what does it take to, realize, to, to make this happen, to realize the idea? And you hire a team, you build the stuff, and you start selling it. The problem is that building the product is probably the most ex expensive part, and selling it is probably the most riskiest. Okay, so you need to change that around. So a better approach would probably be just to build a landing page, which is really, really, really cheap. Start selling the, the heck out of it, then hire the team if you actually got success. If, if nobody responded to your landing page, create a new landing page and try to sell that. And do it 10 times over if you didn't have success with any of them. And, but once you hit the nail, then go out and build it. So, yeah, spoof landing pages is one of the experiments in the book. So just to prove my point here, the naive way of looking at product development is that you will go have an instant blockbuster at first, and then you'll have a successful product. But in reality, uh, you can't uh, hit the right thing at first. Uh, a more realistic view of how to do product development is like this is that you're searching for proof constantly, and again and again and again. So this large portion, which is probably 72%, is trial and error. Okay? This is the most important part of product development, because here, the one who finds the error first wins. And of course, this is not something that just happens once. You go do it again and again and again, and you have more than one hypothesis, OK? So it's not about building a product. It's about mapping down what has to come true for your product to be a success. So 
most can agree that testing is important to create a successful product. I haven't met anybody anywhere that would say otherwise. Everybody agrees that testing is important. But why do so few people do it? Even back 10 years ago when I worked as a developer, I knew that I, I needed to write automated tests. But it was so hard to keep up the discipline. So why is it that we don't do it? I'm not totally sure, but I know. I know that if you map your assumptions and validate them, and you test in a disciplined way, you can get ahead of your game. This might be your game changer if you choose to do this in a disciplined way. This could be your competitive advantage to start testing, because there are so many people, so many companies, so many startups and corporate uh, companies that don't test on a regular basis. So this is my call to you. Go test and do it now. And do it cheap and do it quick. Be disciplined about mapping your assumption and your hypotheses and get going. Okay? So the next problem is measuring is hard. And this, I see this excuse again and again and again, because uh, if we're going to do experiments, uh, we need data. And, and collecting all the data becomes a product in itself. Okay? So, so we need, first, we need valid data. We need to combine data from different sources, and they don't match. Uh, we don't have enough data for it to be significant, so we can't tell anything. We don't have actual proof. And while you could probably live on, on, on less of a quality data, my experience is that, you, is that you can't really win that battle because it's just stakeholders battling it out. So my suggestion is that you turn it around. So instead of looking at the data we, have, uh, we ha already have and see what answers we can find in those, we start with the questions we have and see what data we can create. And this is what you do with experiments. You don't care about all the analytics data. You make your own data. You find out what is, what is it that we need to test, what hypothesis is it that we need to test, and we craft a clever experiment to test that. As an example, if I want to find out if people want to comment on my blog, I'll just create a button that says comment. And if, if a person clicks on it, we'll have the message saying, well, sorry, we're not ready yet, but now we know you're interested. Okay? And if you actually have that communication right and foster it, that can actually be a start uh, of, of a new great relationship because people want to be involved. And it will give you valuable feedback if people are even interested it, in it. A great example uh, is Zappos. This is an American shoe retailer. When they just started out, they didn't have a warehouse. They didn't have a shop. They didn't have inventory. But they wanted to start an online shoe uh, store. So what they did was just to put on a lot of shoes in their store without having anything at all. And if a person uh, would buy a shoe, they would go down to the local physical store and buy that shoe there and send it. Okay? So in the long run, that business model uh, would probably not going to hold, but they got value information on what kind of shoes uh, should we carry, um, what kind of message should we, uh, um, should we spread or should we use in the marketing, uh, what would customers say in customer service. So when they had done this for a couple of months, they were ready. They knew how to execute. So they maximized their so certainty for success. So one pattern, this is called the impersonator uh, experiment. Okay. So in this card deck, there are 60 such uh, experiments. Uh, and crafting experiments is hard. This is why I created it. So it's, it's something that, have found, that is found to be working and one of uh, some of the, the, the biggest companies out there. Uh, and they act as great starting points to, uh, to start testing like this. They're all categorized into being either fast, slow, cheap, or expensive. If you need an existing product or you can just out start up from scratch. And they'll all, all take you from idea to successful product. So when we start out, you want to do quick and cheap experiments. And then you want to move into more higher fidelity uh, prototypes 
uh, that would provide you with more precision, uh, that would be more expensive, uh, and that would decrease your uncertainty. And of course, then your certainty uh, should hopefully rise, the certainty that you'll create a great, successful product. So in that way, you want to start out with, with experiments that don't necessarily provide a certain answer. Well, in fact, you'll never have a certain answer. You've you, you got to kind of respect that. But you'll get more and more, more precise evidence uh, that you're on the right path. And you want to spend, uh, increase your spending as you get more certain, uh, going from are we even on the right direction to how should we actually implement and execute this. So test the most critical assumptions first. So what are the most critical assumptions? The most critical assumptions are those that if, if that is proven wrong, everything else doesn't matter. So it could be that, uh, well, take an, an example from my own world, we were building it, a children's app, uh, and we were actually building it for little over a year, and when we launched it, we found out that all these kids, uh, they didn't have iPads uh, or new iPads, they had iPads too, too, because they had their parents' old iPads. So even though that the iPads were 10 years old, this is what our target, target audience had, but we hadn't tested that. So we had to spend several months uh, trying to make up for that, but if we had tested that in the beginning, it would have saved us for a lot of money. And then later, when you're more certain, you want to test less critical assumptions, but move into higher fidelity uh, prototypes or experiments, more sophisticated uh, experiments that would provide more proof. Okay? So when you test, and this is a uh, rough simplification, uh, there are several, several different uh, check marks that you want to mark off. First, you want to be sure that the problem you're solving is actually worth solving. So if users don't think that this is a major problem, uh, your solution won't be appealing. So this is before you have any product to show at all. Now, next thing is that some users might agree that the problem is worth solving, but are there enough of them to even make up a market? Okay. The next thing, um, so you found out the problem exists, but your solution, does that actually fit that? Do you provide value? And finally, will people actually be willing to put up money? Um, there's, a reason, uh, there's a difference between asking uh, your mom or your friends, uh, would you buy this? Would you pay $20 for it? Most of them will probably say yes. But then if you ask them, okay, so give me the money, uh, they'll probably back down. Okay, so this is, this is the difference. You, you want to go from saying to doing. Okay, you want to uh, craft experiments where you make people, make your audience uh, do real behavior in a way where they leave the experience, say they don't feel uh, unwelcome or uh, like lab rats. Um, so you will test different ideas and you'll probably hit the wall sometimes. Well, that's okay because then you just refine your idea and then go on and at some point, you'll hopefully be able to cross out all of the uh, four different marks. And then, uh, as a rough simplification, you'll probably have higher, as higher certainty that your product will be successful. And sometimes it's okay to borrow from old ideas, of course, uh, and reuse stuff, uh, old learnings. Okay. So let me just give you an example of some really cheap data that's already out there. This is yeah, just do uh, Google Trends to see if, if are people actually Googling for, uh, for the, uh, the, pr the problem you're trying to solve. If you're doing a, a tooth hygiene product, uh, is that a problem? Well, Google it with Google Trends, see uh, if, uh, uh, are people, how much are people actually Googling uh, uh, t pretty teeth or white teeth or whatever, right? Um, another one is this is uh, from, from uh, our own streaming app. Uh, a great way to figure out what people want and the problems they have is just to eat, uh, read app reviews. So here we found out that we have a problem with our subtitles and with our Chromecast. This is in Danish, I'm sorry. Um, but you could also just go to competitors' uh, app stores uh, sites and see what kind of problems are their users struggling with. 
And can, can you get a competitive, competitive advantage by uh, solving those problems before your competitor? You can also just look in industry forms um, to see if, um, if people are, what, what are they talking about. You can even ask uh, questions yourself. So don't ask, I've got this solution, would you buy it? But are you struggling with this? When was the last time you had a problem with this? How are you solving this problem? And people will gladly give you answers to that. And they'll give you great insights into how to ho hopefully make a solution or uh, yeah, move toward your successful product. If you have access to customer logs, even just, uh, just reading them or, or listening in on a uh, call center, uh, do that. You'll probably learn more in one hour than you could just walking around talking to colleagues uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, even better, act as a customer service re representative just for half an hour. Just try to feel it, uh, help as, as answer those questions. This is one of my favorite uh, experiments. Uh, Tim Ferriss, who wrote the 4-Hour Work Week, a very popular book, when he wanted to find out what to call his book, the way he did it was to create a series of uh, Google Ads uh, with different titles. Uh, those, that Google ad would, would all lead to his, his author page. Uh, and on the author page, uh, they didn't show the book just about him, but what he wanted to test was what kind of title uh, is more, more appealing to users. Uh, and the title that won was the four-hour work week. So running test ads could be an experiment as well. And we'll get answers in a day. So. There are two different mindsets here. There's the left side and there's the, the right side. The left side is, is about invention, about innovation. And the right side is about improvement, optimization. And so far we've talked pretty much on, about innovation. But I would argue you can easily use the same kind of mindset in the improvement space as well. So when we wanted to... Uh, changed things up at my previous company where I worked. Uh, we were doing a new uh, front page of, of Denmark's largest media site, uh, dr.dk. And we wanted to, we knew how the old version performed. We wanted to make a new one. And everybody uh, in senior management, uh, they really wanted, this was our, one of our most important and prestigious projects. Uh, they wanted to see how it felt and looked before they could sign off. So they wanted the, the old approach uh, and said that that is probably not so good because you can go out with a big bang and can change a bunch of things. Uh, but the problem is that well, we might know how it's going to look and that's going to help stakeholder management, but we have no clue of how it's going to perform. If we change 10 different elements and if it goes bad, we have no idea which one of those elements would actually uh, be the reason why it didn't perform. Similarly, if it went well, we have no learning to say what is it that we should do more of. So instead, we went the other way with the incremental redesign where we experimented our way to a new front page. So we just changed one thing at a time. So instead of developing for uh, four months uh, and coming out with this big bang, we developed for four months, just released one uh, feature or one design change at a time. So for users, uh, this was actually better because we didn't change up everything at once. And for us, it was so great also because we actually could control how this performed along the way. So in the first example up there, the good thing was that we knew how it's going to look, but not that how it's going to perform. And with incremental redesign, you had no clue how it's going to look but we knew that it was going to perform better than what we had today. So when you have a successful product, uh, you have KPIs, you have data. So there you can do a bunch of other stuff. And what's most important in this whole experimentation mindset is to start with a vision. 
with the vision, you can change the direction underneath. So go from vision to measurable K KPIs, then um, go to the prioritized uh, experiment backlog. So how we did it, just to give you an example, is that we parted our strategy, uh, our vision, into three things and made KPIs for each of them. I'm not going to through, go through them all, uh, but just to show you how we did it so you can go home and, and, and do this on Monday if you want to, of course. And then for each, ca each uh, theme, we would have uh, primary KPIs and secondary KPIs. And f then the next step was to create an experiment backlog. And we had, had, had different ideas on what was going to lift this performance. And we uh, marked each experiment in what kind of theme uh, that it would fall into. And then we defined each experiment and said we have a hypothesis. We'll do an experiment to prove that hypothesis either wrong or true, false or true. And also, we define how success looked like and failure as well. So in this case, we would do a, uh, a Wizard of Oz experiment, hand-holding some things, because if this was true, we could build, uh, bring in the expensive recommendation engine later. But at this point in time, we just wanted to find out if this was actually a better way to do it. Okay, And this is, I'm, this is actually my, um, what I'm going to show you now is actually my favorite experiment of all time. It's called the, uh, come on, click. It's called the takeaway test. So if you have an existing feature or an existing product, just start taking things away. And if nobody reacts, then it's probably a good thing. And I think more people should do this more often. OK, so, and this is, I know this is old, but it's so important everybody forgets it. And the minimal viable product is not a product. It's a process. So it's a process of experimentation where you repeatedly ask two questions. What's my riskiest assumption? And what's the smallest experiment that I can do to test it? So the most important question for your team isn't what's it, what is left. So you'll be stuck in tunnel vision, but what is unknown? Okay. So back to this publishing a book. It is my live goal. But I actually think I, I had it wrong. Because what I was describing with publishing a book is a tactic. And my vision of, of wanting to help product builders kick ass, that's the one true thing that should stay intact. So I should actually just change it around, starting with a vision, which would then be uh, to help product builders kick ass at what they love to do. Then my strategy would be that I could help others learn from my own hard-earned experiences uh, and help them get ahead of their game. And one way to do that would be to create a book. Now, of course, I could also do it with the cards, right? Because then I would still achieve my vision. Or, of course, I could do something else. I could have an event of my own if I wanted to. Or it doesn't have to be me. Okay, so what stays true and intact is the vision. And you need to embrace that mindset if you're doing experiments. That you can change everything. And the solution that you first started was fun. And this, it is my life goal, but it might not be what it takes to fulfill my vision. Then you're onto the right path. All right, so um, that was actually it. Uh, if you're interested, you can, of course, get hold of these uh, cards. Uh, I got a bunch of with me. Um, so grab me, take hold of me during the, next, the rest of the day. And uh, Christian, if you can come back up on the stage, because uh, that was my talk. <laughs>